Okay, hi everyone. I think we'll get started now, just um, looking at the time. Uh, welcome to this uh, ETH and uh, uh, Swiss School of Public Health uh, joint, uh, of course, lecture series. This is Public Health. Uh, it's a pleasure to see some faces actually live and not that we're always behind the computer screen as usual as we've been forced to do thanks to COVID uh, for the last year. So great to see uh, so many faces also here present uh, with us uh, in Zurich. Uh, for those who are watching via the live stream, uh, please excuse us that you cannot see us. Unfortunately, you can only hear us, but I hope that nevertheless you can benefit from this and, and uh, see the screen still. Uh, for the students who have any questions, please do refer to the uh, Zoom uh, link, which you were sent via email, uh, and you can interact uh, in terms of questions on the chat or also by uh, speaking. So we will be able to hear you when the time for question comes. Uh, what we do, uh, this is the first of the, uh, the lecture series. What we do uh, in terms of format is we uh, start off um, by introducing ourselves. So my name is uh, Emily Reeves and I'm from the Swiss School of Public Health. I was formerly uh, the project manager for the uh, SSPH Plus uh, Expo project, which some of you may have uh, already been familiar with, perhaps through the Expo Dubai training program. Uh, and some students actually joined us live in Dubai, and it will be a pleasure for me to present uh, some of what we did at the Expo in Dubai a little bit later. Um, but before I do that, I will invite um, the Dean of the Swiss School of Public Health, Nina Künzli, to just come up and talk to us about what the Swiss School of Public Health is all about. Um, and then we will have uh, an uh, expert from the field, a professor, who will be talking to us about uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, and we'll have some insights on that. And after uh, his lecture of 30 minutes, we will have uh, time for some questions and for discussion for the students who are present and for those who are joining us uh, online as well. Um, so without further ado, I pass on the word to the Dean of the Swiss School of Public Health, which is Professor Nino Künzli. Emily, thank you very much. It's a big pleasure to see you here. Yes, I share this excitement. Um, it's a long time ago we had this pleasure. Uh, this is public health. When we discussed um, with, with your call town a few years ago how to bring public health to this community, um, we still felt like, well, people don't know what public health is. And then came the pandemic. So I think you now know at least one element of what public health is. And it's an ugly one, the pandemic. But as you will learn through this lecture series, um, public health has many, many other, other um, dimensions. And if I move forward here, that's here. Um, I just want to tell you a little word today about the Swiss School of Public Health, which is a very unique story, very Swiss. hundred years ago, we had the last pandemic. Many, many prestigious universities funded schools of public health in their universities. And you can name it. I mean, all the big ones um, in the US, in the UK. So they celebrate 100 years now with the pandemic. Switzerland took almost 100 years to start with the School of Public Health. So 17 years ago, the School of Public Health has been created and it is a very unique structure. We are a foundation. We don't have a roof. We have a little office led by Dr. Sandra Nocera, who is actually here behind the mask. Uh, we, that's the team. Yeah? And this is the foundation. These are the, the president. And I'm sure he will also show up once in one of these pitches. Uh, Milo here from Zurich, Suzanne from Uzi. Very, very small, but what we are, well, we have filled in the gap in the Swiss universities. Not a single university has created a school of public health. So here we are. We decided, well, there are, of course, all these public health scientists all over. It's not that we have no science in public health, but they don't have a faculty. They don't have a department. There is no institute. But we realized together we are a virtual faculty, and that's what we are. So we are the virtual faculty of public health professors who 
self-identify with being public health scientists and they are elected professors in their universities. You see, currently we are 12. We are in discussions with ETH, with EPFL, which uh, also the University of Applied Science of the French part, HUSSO, uh, because, of course, they also have professors who are engaged in public health-oriented research. So that's how we create the School of Public Health and that's what we are. And um, it's a very big pleasure that we can do this lecture together with ETH. And uh, our plan is that after, at the end of the lecture series, you have learned little, little stories also bit to understand what this uh, School of Public Health is, what we, do, what we do, what we offer. And actually, maybe for some of you, it might open a career path. Yeah? So that's all I wanted to tell you for this very beginning today. And I'm happy to give back... Uh, to Emily. So, Dr. Reeves, actually, you were an SSPH plus PhD student not long ago. Yeah, please. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Right, yes, I did uh, my, PhD, my PhD studies at the University of Basel. And after that, I, um, I started at the Swiss School of Public Health for the Expo project. Um, like I mentioned, some of you may already be familiar with it. If you are not, there is this QR code behind me that you are f welcome to download. Actually, um, just to give you a bit of an idea about what it is in itself, uh, the Expo project is was all about sustainable health, so health in relationship to all the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Uh, and we got our community, uh, our SSPH Plus community, really involved, our faculty members, our students, uh, and they got involved through a training program, also through um, submitting questions uh, and answers for a quiz all about health in relationship to all the sustainable development goals, so from their own research. And the idea was to use this quiz to be able to um, showcase it in Dubai at the Swiss Pavilion of the Dubai Expo. And essentially then um, visitors could come and take a look at this quiz and find out a little bit more about health in relationship to all the SDGs. Um, so um, I thought it might be interesting just to kind of give you a bit of an insight as I mentioned, the QR code takes you to lots of stuff about the Expo, um, stuff that's just very um, all about the SDGs, but from different perspectives, even artistic perspectives. So I do encourage you to take a look at that. But I thought today, perhaps um, just to give you a taste for what the quiz was like, um, that we could actually go and have a look at a quiz question that was submitted by somebody who may look familiar here. Um, so... No, it doesn't go to the quiz question. No, the QR code goes to the, um, to the quiz in general. But the link that I have here goes to um, a specific question. Oh. Hmm, technical issues. Here we go. Which is this question here? Hopefully, you can all read it. And those who are watching on the live stream and who are connecting via Zoom uh, and also watching the live stream can see it. Um, oh, you don't see my screen. No one sees my screen. Okay. Um, Let me try this one. Perhaps now? Yeah. So this is one of, this is an example of a quiz question that was submitted by one of our members of the community of the Swiss School of Public Health. So anyway, um, if you take a look behind me, you can see it's about air quality. So it's not necessarily related to uh, the topic of this lecture today. Um, but perhaps, I don't know what your... Uh, what your backgrounds have been, or if you know anything about this topic at all. But perhaps if we're reading this question here, um, somebody might like to volunteer an answer. Um, it's just multiple choice. Uh, feel free to just take a second guess. Um, so it's during the past 30 years, how did ambient air quality change in the cities around the globe? It got A, much worse almost everywhere, B, much better almost everywhere, 
or sea, much better in Western countries and much worse in Asia and Africa. Yes? Could I give you the microphone so you can say that out again so that those who are listening can... I would say it's the third option. Anyone else have an opinion on that? No, we're going with the third option. Uh, Any particular reason for that? Okay, so I think around 100 years ago, it got much worse in Western countries, and since then awareness grew that we have to take care, better take care of how we burn, for example, trash. But in Asia and Africa, that awareness had, or not that it's not as present, but it hasn't been worked on quite as much as in Europe or in Western countries. That's my reasoning. Great. Let's take a look and see. Um, Let's put your answer in here. And what you see here, I've given it away here a little bit by the picture, but you see that the author is in fact sitting with us in the room so he can give us a bit more of a better explanation uh, to this answer here. But um, actually you'll find that when you go to the um, the digital quiz app, so through the QR code that I showed earlier, you will be able to see uh, in detail lots of different quiz questions and answers like this one with an explanation to them and also with some information about the author. Um, so I don't know if you want to say anything to to the uh... yeah. So in the TV show, you would get uh, maybe ten thousand Swiss francs for your answer. Yeah, that's great. Maybe we find a sponsor for doing the same way. Yes, you're totally right. And this is actually the fantastic news for the Western countries and terrible for the rest of the world. Um, Jörg Goldhahn right now he told me he's in Davos at a meeting. I grew up in Davos. Can you imagine when I was a child going to school, I was inhaling air quality that was worse up in Davos than it is today in the worst place you can find in Switzerland. Yeah? And that's the drastic improvement of air quality. Yeah, so I'm an air quality and health scientist, which is also public health, but not the topic of today. Emily. <laughs> So thank you, and uh, thanks for indulging me in that. Um, It would be great if you have time to go ahead and take a look at the quiz and see what you think, and also give me your feedback, because we'd love to make sure that the quiz questions and answers are accessible for anybody, so not just for us here, um, for those who are in academia, but just um, that your everyday person, anyone around the globe, can be able to understand sustainable health. That would be great. And if you have any questions, please do also get in touch with me via the email. Sorry, I'm not sure why the clicker is now not working anymore. Uh, In any case, moving on, um, as mentioned before, every uh, series, every session of the lecture series will uh, invite a... um an expert from the field to discuss their research and their expertise with us. So um, today we have um, a professor at the Faculty of Biomedical Studies at the Università della Svizzera Italiana, uh, Professor Emiliano Albanese, and he will be talking to us uh, this evening about a public health approach to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's everywhere, but nobody knows what it is. You will. So uh, without further ado, I uh, invite uh, Professor Albanese to come and talk to us about this. And in the meantime, uh, I will be switching over the slides. So for those who are watching on the live stream, your screen may go blank for a moment. Uh, Please don't worry. Um, We are just uh, connecting one laptop to another laptop and making sure that you can see the slides. Uh, Please note that in the future, this will not be the case. You should be able to also see those who are speaking as well as the slides. Um, So that's something that we're working on. In the meantime, I pass the word over to you. Okay, so I have a mic here, so you should be hearing me, or this one. 
whatever. No. You're nodding for what? <laughs> no, it's, it's this one is working? Oh, good. Okay. So I have one more hand. Okay. So uh, very good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I can pull off my mask. This is a statement because of my surname, of course. So uh, it's a bit of a joke. Um, as so I can get rid of this. So I'm here, I'm standing, even though those at home cannot see me, but they can hear me. Thanks to all who came, could make it and come here and join us. I actually uh, did give a lecture in the first series of what is uh, This is Public Health, um, right before uh, the pandemic started. So I think it, it, it is also, on a personal note, quite interesting that that was the last, so the wave was going through, so it was already there in Ticino, where I live, and I was coming from Geneva, it was snowing, and you could feel that something was about to happen. But no one would have imagined something on this scale, of course, back then. Now, the public health approach that I'm going to be talking to you about of the, of the pandemic is something that has concerned all of us, because in a definition, the simplest one that we can give of public health, that is addressing health at the population level, well, nothing more than a pandemic, which is on a global scale, addresses, um, uh, it, it means addressing a health issue at a population level. That's what public health is, essentially. But there are some strategic and important concepts that concern to public health, which I maintain that have not been made explicit, not just to the general public, but also to clinicians and to students like you are and to anybody who's listening at home. And we want to cover this. We struggled to try and make the case that this was extremely important for a number of reasons. So that's what I'm going to be talking to you about, just what it is this public health approach to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and to any epidemic. And what you see here listed is that, okay, there are some learning objectives, since you, you, by the end of the lecture, you may be able to provide some definitions, but would like to keep this as interactive as possible because we all share an experience of the COVID-19 and a perspective. And your perspective as medical students, of course, is one where you have lived um, uh, you know, acquiring knowledge about medical science, but not necessarily about public health related to the pandemic itself. So the, the main thing is that somewhat um, the, the, the actions that we take at a population level based on the epidemiology, so the distribution and impact of the, of the pandemic, the epidemic, the disease itself, the infectiousness, so what happens, and the public health decisions that we take, so population level, subgroups in the populations, not, not individual level, all together are aimed at reducing the impact of the disease, and in this case, of the spreading of, the, of an infectious disease. But why does that matter, uh, that matters to you? Well, as clinicians, of course, you want to know where patients, people with the disease, with symptoms of different severity and different course of a disease that was not known until a couple of years ago, where they are pulled out from. They, of course, come from the, 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 the general uh, population as a group and community uh, in, in terms of where they are from. But, of course, you learn about the disease from a clinical perspective. So learning about the public health perspective gives you uh, the bigger picture, which is fundamental. So you get to know the disease through the, the most severe cases. That's exactly what happened at the beginning of the pandemic. And you have no idea about risk and protective factors and what may be done to prevent the disease to occur in the first place and to actually hope for a better course. So there are implications for prognosis as well. But also, as clinicians and medical students as well, you are mostly concerned like experts in the world. So people may refer to you to ask questions and get elucidation about measures and behaviors that have been asked to put in place so that they would comply. So you have to be able to give explanations of why we're wearing a mask. Why are you wearing a mask? And that's the simplest thing you can think of. Why have we you know, quarantine or isolation and things like this. And giving an explanation of this is not necessarily on a basis only on common sense. It should be grounded in something that is truly and purely public health. Now, uh, about the glossary, I shared in the readings so something that uh, I wrote because it was something that we put, pulled together uh, as a working document for SUS School of Public Health members and Professor Milo Puam will talk about a, a national program, a research program that is aimed at, at informing um, public health response. And we needed a glossary. Why did we need a glossary? Because we need a common lexicon whereby when we say something, 
we must be sure that everybody understands um, the words that we use, uh, the concepts that we use in the same ways. Otherwise, of course, we cannot get uh, a proper understanding. We cannot understand each other. And we can't understand the epidemic itself because most of the things that happened are new and we also came up with new, new names, starting from the disease name. Okay, so there is a lexicon, there is a taxonomy. So we made an effort to actually pi compile this in a highly interactive way, not coming up with definitions, but citing sources where these definitions came uh, from and making this glossary as interactive as possible. And you have it in the document that I share with you, which is informal. And it's a dynamic and growing uh, document you can go back to. And none of these definitions uh, is definitive. But at least we have something to refer to so that people can speak the same language, blah, blah, blah. Key concepts. Okay, so we dive into more of the content of what is this public health approach, and we need to first and foremost understand that one aspect of any epidemic, so the rapid spreading of, in this case, a new disease, but any disease, a rapid spreading is essentially uh, an accumulation in terms of epidemiological terms an incidence that is much higher than what would be expected. We say usually in a defined region, but in this case, it's spread out um, to, to the whole world. Okay, this is a dynamic, and you may now be familiar with the fact that we have faced an exponential growth. I know, particularly at ETA, that you study uh, mathematics quite much. So you should teach me uh, what is an exponential growth. Um, and I think that though this, if it works is the best way to show it. I think you have seen this example. So essentially doubling on the chess board uh, with the rice grains, just doubling. This is what would happen with an exponential growth after only a few squares. So we are, we're not even a tenth into the board. Keep doubling, keep doubling uh, with, the, with the previous one. The problem is that the more we move into the board, the less we're good in making predictions in how many rice grains we would need to the point that this guy cannot really feel it. And so this is now the kitchen where he's sitting and he's showing how much grains, how many grains now each grain would count for 100 and then 1,000 because there are not as many rice grains in the entire world to fill the chessboard. So that's the problem with an exponential growth. And this is the first concept about a dynamic, grasping the dynamic. And that was, of course, a major concern at the very beginning of the pandemic because the prediction was, okay, we, we cannot grasp it, but we know it's going to grow very fast if it keeps doubling, doubling. And that doubling thing is, see, this, is, this gets funny, but it wasn't if you think that rice grains were patients potentially, okay? Like the entire world would be infected. Okay, so this is the graphic, the easiest representation of that is like, this is what human beings would predict. So essentially, that okay, it's a growth, uh, that this is going to increase in terms of infections, in terms of cases, but no one can really figure out uh, how much, the size of it. You can click on, on the hyperlink. This is a typical representation of one case infecting three more. And assuming an entirely, uh, a population is entirely susceptible to the infectious disease because it's new, which is not of an assumption, it's a fact, and it was a fact for COVID-19 in the very beginning, that's what would happen. That scenario depends largely on, okay, but how many people on average would an infected person infect themselves? So how many more? can we expect? And that is something that, of course, as we now know, uh, depends on the disease, but depends enormously by what we do to prevent this contagion to occur. But at some point, uh, the susceptibility of the population, so people who may actually have acquired an immunity, uh, either through the disease or vaccines, and we will come to this, of course, as you know, uh, the the potential of the same disease to infect other people would change over time. And so we have to keep monitoring this so that we can keep making predictions of the spreading. You have heard this term several times, the R0. Uh, you may not know the origin of the R0. Uh, actually, it's uh, fairly interesting that uh, um, this is based uh, on, a, on a mathematical representation or description of something that was grasped in the study of malaria. But the R0 essentially is what it is, is that the average number of people that are infected starting from the first one, okay? And the assumption of an entirely susceptible um, population 
is the not in the R, okay, in the reproductive number, which change to R T and R E depending on how many are considered or can be considered as uh, uh, still susceptible to getting infected. But the formula is what interests us the most, because in understanding the terms of the formula, can we uh, uh, give a sense to the things that we do at a population level in terms of prevention, so reducing the R in respective of what we know about the disease itself. So that D times C times beta is what we're going to be focusing on. So essentially, well, the duration of the infectiousness, of course, is directly related to the R0. Because infectiousness is for how long, if I am infected, I can be infectious to others. If that lasts only one day, my opportunities, in respective of how many people I meet on average on every day, is much less than a disease that keeps me infectious, so able to pass on the pathogen to someone else for 20 days. That's easy understood, okay? And that's fairly a characteristic of the disease itself, or better, the pathogen. C is, of course, okay, given a certain amount of infectiousness of the pathogen, well, then it depends of the contact between an infected person and a susceptible person. Right? Easy to understand. And that's where we intervene the most. But the beta, I think, is also quite interesting as well. Because, of course, it depends on how many people I interact with, but also how I interact with them. And what may work to reduce the actual contagion so the fact that the pathogen goes physically from an infected person to a susceptible person. And that's why you're wearing a mask. Okay? So now, how did we operate on these three terms, all directly associated with the um, R0? Well, essentially, you can think that vaccines, there is a lot of insistence that vaccines were revolutionary, a game changer, uh, for a number of reasons. But one thing that they did or could do, essentially, may reduce the infectiousness of the pathogen itself. That's quite interesting. So if I'm vaccinated and I've not been exposed before, if the pathogen attacks me, it is assumed and hoped that the vaccine will reduce the infectiousness of the pathogen because it would fight, uh, uh, fight it and reduce it and give to it less opportunities to replicate. And when it goes to virus, and viruses, as you know, would require another organism to replicate. So if that organism get vaccinated, that replication opportunity is reduced. Fine, fair enough. But vaccines may operate at another level, essentially reducing at the population level the proportion, the number of people who are still susceptible to get infected. Because if that C is essentially a matrix of how many are still susceptible with respect to those who are infected, if we can get people resistant to the infectious, not through getting the disease, but essentially providing them with an immune response, which is by definition what vaccines do, we essentially reduce the, susceptible, the proportion of susceptible individuals in the population. It is very powerful if we attain very high coverages, okay? which was uh, ugly discussed in the past months. That's why um, Tedros, the WHO um, director, has stated that, of course, vaccines were expected to be game changers, but he should have said vaccination programs. Okay, uh, because the coverage, of course, was the major uh, contributor to this aspect. Now, you see here some of the public health measures which are considered to be basics, and in fact they were, like quarantine, isolations, and things like physical distancing, which still may be in place to some extent, which of course would make sense, but it was basic because we had no other things to, wa to work with and operate with, but it can be quite fairly effective, and they, and they were, because we control the spreading of, of, the, uh, of the pandemic and the epidemic in different regions, depending also on how much these measures were enforced. And we know that comparisons between countries can tell us that in those countries where quarantine and isolations were done and were put to the extremes, of course, the number of cases were kept much lower. Of course, then there are uh, ethical, moral, political, many other sorts of concerns on how strong can you push on that. And masks probably is the one operating on the probability on transmission, along with other things like, I don't know, shields when you go to shops now, and other things like this. So putting a barrier, so essentially the droplet, which is still thought to be the major means through which the virus passes from an infected to a susceptible person, if we can put a barrier to droplet, of course, that would work. So this is why uh, a concept, which is a, 
a pure public health concept, which comes from infectious disease epidemiologists, like the basic reproductive number, gives you sense of the major public health intervention at the population level. You, as future clinicians and knowledgeable people, must be able to draw this graph and explain to a person who's reluctant to wear their mask why that's not necessarily stupid, but it's essentially diminishing the possibility to contribute to reducing the R0. Because, it's, in essence, this is, you know, all these are factors, and so we want to operate on them at the same time. And this is why we try to explain to politicians that when vaccines came, it was not wise to reduce other public health measures because simply we would get rid of other possibilities to contribute to reduction of R0. And that was a strong argument also because we did not have evidence about the efficacy and effectiveness of vaccination, not necessarily the vaccines themselves, which were proved in experimental context. But we didn't know about the infectiousness or the probability of getting reinfected. Here are some few comments. Now, let me give you a little bit of a um, less technical explanation with a, with a storytelling of where all this comes in part from. You may be familiar with Ebola. Some of you may also know that it's the name of a river. Did you know it's the name of a river? You didn't know that, right. Where is this river? Try and guess. Where could it be? Can, well, can you tell it from the figure? No, not yet. It's in Africa. It's in the Republic of Congo. So it's very much in the middle of Africa, okay? And, of course, it's also the name of a disease. It's the name also of the pathogen, which you see here in a very nice picture. Now... Ebola is something that was dreadful, and it, 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 it was first started in, in the 70s, okay? But there are resurges, so it keeps coming back uh, over and over. And there are some geographical uh, distributions, particularly in Western Africa. So we know and we acknowledge that there are some, um, some cases, some classes, some epidemics that are uh, controlled or self-constrained to some regions for some reasons that we know about. Now, I have highlighted in particular these countries because the story I'm going to tell you about is a story of a fact that even though Ebola is calculated to have an R0 of two. So a reproductive number of two means that one person with Ebola would on average pass it on to two people. So it's worrying. It's worrying because above one, it means that it has the potential to cause an epidemic. But it hasn't in a, in a, at a global scale as a pandemic. And there are a few explanations for that. But the reason I'm giving you the example of Ebola, we could, we could say many things, is because these are not should be considered as a, an average. So it seems, and this is highly documented, that there was a girl aged eight years, so she was eight years old, who traveled by bus, taxis, so in all public transportation, at the beginning of an outbreak in between Guinea and Mali for thousands of kilometers, okay, with her family. And she was sick when they left, but they carried her along because nobody knew about Ebola at that time, and she was the first case of an imported Ebola case into Mali. They tracked back with something that you are now very familiar with, which is the uh, contact tracing. So essentially, they went back from a case, a diagnosed case of Ebola in Mali, this girl, and they tracked back all people who got in contact with her. Hundreds of people. That was a huge effort. None of them got the disease. And I would say, okay, but if they say on average it were two people, what would have happened? Why? What is the explanation? And the explanation is that these average must be contextualized with the characteristic of the disease, the fact that the disease is lethal in most cases and that people are heavily affected by it. The severity of the disease is serious. And this girl was actually carried along by their family and could not get in contact with anybody else but their family members. And, and that's why she died and her mom died. But nobody else did because she, the mom was the only other person who got in contact with her. So a good understanding of this is, which we still don't have about COVID-19, of course, would give an explanation that the r not doesn't tell us the full story. So let me skip the clinical part. I think that uh, apart from the symptoms of Ebola and other things, is highly lethal, people have an hemorrhagic fever, uh, so on and so forth. But it is a good example because the reservoir is bats, exactly like COVID-19. And in fact, species of bats, uh, which is a mammifer, as you know, uh, mimic what is supposed to have happened for COVID-19. So this lab in Republic of Congo that monitors since the 70s 
whether there are mutations in new variants that may be passed on from bath who do not suffer any Ebola symptoms. They're pre absolutely fine with this virus and this pathogen. When it goes to humans through because they bite a human, because they may scratch him, because anything, because we may eat bats, whatever, or in the markets, etc. Then there are all these uh, species jumps, so it can get from the reservoir to the species jumps. Exactly what is ex supposed to have happened with COVID-19, but there, there is no certainty yet about it. So Ebola can come back and does come back because there are variants that are created simply by replications of the RNA of the virus in bats, what is absolutely fine and benign. But then at some point, some of these variants may be highly pathogen and infectious for humans. So there is a lab which is led by the US, the CDC in the Republic of Congo. And there is this very dangerous job where these researchers actually do go into the forest. They take bats and they take samples of their blood to analyze whether the virus has changed and whether the new variants are highly infectious. So nothing new. Or the COVID-19. This is something we have been doing since the 70s, and it affected also the interpretation of the R0. Okay? Now, moving on to the dynamic. So this is back to how do we get an understanding of the dynamic of the spreading of the infections, because that was the huge concern, how fast and in, 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 in how serious would have been the spreading of the infections. He says, well, the flattening of the curve is something that you heard a lot about, particularly during the first wave of the pandemic, and that amply justified lockdowns all over the world. So flattening is this. Essentially, you have the number of cases that may go up linearly or much more exponentially in a certain amount of time. The flattening of the curve is not the reduction, so the curve, the area under the curve stays the same. So the number of cases is the same. We're just spreading cases over time. And that's exactly what we did during the first wave. Most people didn't grasp it. So we were not actually preventing cases to occur. We were just distributing them over time. Why did we do that? Why would it make sense to just say, okay, we will have exactly the same number, amount of, number of cases, but over a longer period of time? Why does it make sense? Any idea? Yeah? Okay, let me repeat your comment for those who may be at home and have not heard that. So the idea is that because we don't want cases to occur at the same time and go, those who have to, to the hospital at the same time, because we have limited capacity, which means limited number of beds, and we are limited in terms of providing care to them, starting from diagnosis, not necessarily treating them. Okay, so if we spread them a long time, we will be able to provide care in a, in, a, in a better way. That's okay. Also, we can assume and hope that over time we will be better in making diagnosis and treating people with the same disease. So it's ethical to think that it's better to spread people over time. But we were not aiming at preventing cases and the disease or infections to occur in the first place. That would have been too ambitious. Anyway, that's... So these sparing and protecting the health system and services was enough to justify something completely unprecedented, what was locking down, so closing society. Because if the system, the health system, not necessarily only service, collapsed, everything else would have collapsed. But there was a misunderstanding there. So people thought that they were protecting themselves. No, they were contributing to protect the health system, which is significantly different. Okay, It may have been perceived in different ways in the general population. You should know this, you should be able to explain this and to persuade people that it still makes a lot of sense for everybody. Now, let me get to another aspect of the dynamics. So we mentioned that already, that the R0 largely depends on the number or the proportion of those who are still susceptible, because of course, fewer people susceptible are out there, the fewer the, the virus has the possibility to replicate in other people and infect other people. Now, this is a graph of is evidence from the Corona uh, Immunity Study, in particular data from uh, Ticino, the way you read this, is you have dates here, the peaks of the waves uh, where we actually collected the blood samples and why did we collect it to extract serum because in serum as you know um, there is the suspension there are the proteins of the blood including the antibodies 
and antibodies. Tests would tell us whether a person was or was not infected with COVID-19. So this is the ultimate way to make uh, a measurement, an epidemiological measure of the number of people who got infected uh, in the first place. And you see the different age groups, and as it was predicted, the solid line is the surveillance, so is what the Federal Office of Public Health would tell us in terms of in cumulative incidence, so number of cases based on cases definitions, based on the availability of tests. So it was not accurate. It was for sure an underestimation. And it may have been even a biased estimation because at the beginning, only people who had symptoms were tested. And what about all the others, which we now know that were the vast majority? So these antibodies actually told us, the metrics are on that side and this side, that actually the infections spread a lot more than what we thought in the beginning. So that's why we need, and for many other reasons, and Professor Milo Puan will explain to you why we needed zero surveys. So surveys that are using population representative samples of people, thousands of people from whom we have to take blood and measure in their serum whether they have antibodies versus the disease. That's the only way to determine whether the proportion of people who are still susceptible to the infection is going down. And this is extremely important to predict the potential spreading also in the future of the infection itself. Okay? And we may come to comments and questions of where we are right now. Now, this graph is quite, it's been quite interesting because <coughs> by age groups, you can see that all the adults in the, the green bars tell us those who have antibodies thanks to the vaccines, not to the infection. So the older people actually were, had um, antibodies due to infection, not much, not very much, in presumably because they did protect themselves. They were scared because lethality hospitalization was much higher because of the diseases, so they refrained from, and maybe they have a different social life. It was easier for them to stay at home, so to reduce drastically the, the likelihood of getting infected with an infected person. But what it really matters here is that vaccination did work. So when coverage was, coverage was really high, and in all the adults it was crazy high, including in Switzerland, in most cantons, not all, but in most cantons, which means that coverage went even above 95%. Indeed, in this age group, we did find that 95% of people did have antibodies, which is great, because at least in terms of functional immunity, which means once you have the antibodies, the course of the disease is much better, is a lot less severe. But you see also that in, in the other age groups, Vaccination couldn't explain anything in children because at that time they couldn't even have the vaccine. Okay. Now, <coughs> the other half of the key concept you want to consider is that, of course, not only the dynamic of the infection matters from a public health perspective before the clinical implications, is how impactful a disease is. And you can think about many indicators and metrics, but of course, the capacity which we mentioned, so how much a disease causes access to and use of existing resources in a limited time, because that's the definition of an epidemic, that these cases would peak in a very contracted time, because these health services are there to serve the health needs of the population. And they're being built and made available proportionate to the average needs. So this concentration would drain capacity and resources from other things that we need to do, like surgery, like cardiovascular disease, like cancer, you name them. Okay, that's the first thing. But of course, how much it contributes to mortality, to morbidity, any other metrics of impact of the disease itself, which is not necessarily related to the infectiousness or the spreading of the disease itself, but will inform how hard we are and how strong we are in public health level preventive measures to justify the fact that if we want to reduce the impact, even though maybe the R0 is not crazy high, like measles. Do you know how, what is the R0 of a measles? So how many person, uh, yeah? Yeah, even a little bit more, 12. That means that a person, a child, with measles, if they keep doing what they're doing, usually go to the crash, to the you know, school, they would infect on average 12 more. So in a few days, that's why we go crazy when we have one case of measles, okay? Because it's like in three days, all children in Zurich will have it, okay? But if that's not the only thing. Measles is hugely impactful because, as you know, even though the proportion of those infected who got serious, serious clinical uh, repercussions is fairly low, those who do can die. Okay. Now, let me 
Let me check the time. Mm, okay. Let me skip the Zika. We can come back to Zika, even though it's, it's kind of exotic. You can tell it's exotic because it's, it started from a remote island in the Pacific Ocean. But we can come back to this storytelling at a later point, if we still have time. Bleep, 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 bleep. Because I really need to cover this with you. Now that we set the stage that epidemiology, which by definition, and you must know this by now, is the cornerstone of public health because it informs not only the occurrence and impact of diseases, how much, how often, where, so the temporal uh, and geographic changes, fantastic, but also tells us uh, clues about risk and protective factors and how we can modify this. So it informs epidemiology interventions that we make um, to prevent but also to tackle uh, the existence of diseases and uh, to reduce their impact. Now, in general, so generally speaking, we can simply put say that a public health approach uh, starts with describing a health-related phenomenon. Uh, that's, you know, descriptive epidemiology, like prevalence. How many have the disease in a given population? And understanding. So I try to answer that fantastic questions about what caused a disease in the first place. And it's hard uh, in many cases, to demonstrate. But also that a public health approach entails that as soon as we have this knowledge and the evidence, we have to increase awareness, of course, in healthcare workers, but also in the general population, because that's the level where we measure the occurrence and the impact of the diseases. Now, interestingly enough, we want to have a concerted effort. So public health acts at the population level, but it also acts transsectorially. So it's not just the health sector, is education, is you name it, uh, I don't know, it's economy, is whatever other sector in society that may have direct or indirect interests or may have a, or exert an impact on the, the population's health. And that's why we need policies, because we need documents, plans, strategies that would bind people on a unique agenda with precise objectives and goals and other things. But we need evidence to say, okay, what are the objectives that can be set up for us to pursue and also what is possible and how can we do things? And, of course, based on this, we can decide about a, a proper infrastructure. Now, for the COVID-19 pandemic, this had to be done in a rush because the pandemic was occurring. And you may have heard the term preparedness. So how ready were we at the beginning of the pandemic for a pandemic? Well, not much. Not, not just we in, in Switzerland, but most countries in the world were not, okay? Uh, albeit, and that's the other reading that I attached as a reading for today's class, the World Health Organization had released how to respond to epidemics in 2018. So those who blame the WHO to not have been enough uh, reactive and proactive after the initial cases or the pandemic or when they declared the pandemic, they should rethink this statement because the act actually member states were well behind because only in 2018, so a couple of years, uh, the, the year before, two, two years before the pandemic outbreak started, they had released exactly what to do and what you see here listed in terms of infrastructure and what should be put in place is also in that document, including a part about communication to which we'll come in a minute. Now, uh, I'll, I'll go fast with this, but because we need responses that occur and happen at a population level where we assume and want and, and pretend sometimes, and we even force people to have high adherence, because otherwise none of these measures would work, we need to work with the public, with the people, with the population, for the population. And this is very difficult, and, this, and the blame is on us. Uh, as physicians, as medical doctors, as clinicians, we tend to think that we should patronize patients and the population should do this because I know, because I know about health. Well, it will never work when it goes to individual health. It, for sure, it's impossible when it goes at a population level, particularly for prevention, where the perception of risk is usually very low. Let me go fast with this. few words about communication before we move on to the public health approaches. Well, what communication are we talking about here? Well, first and foremost about the fact that, yeah, we have to inform. And authorities have to inform about a number, few things, those that are re in, uh, relevant and that everybody should know, starting from risk, the public health interventions, measures, things that should be put in place. So today we enter this room with doubts about should we be wearing a mask? So authorities should find ways to let us know uh, you know, so that we are not confused. And that happened 
over and over during the pandemic. So we had some troubles about it. Um, the other thing is that in, we tend to think that that's the only information that matters. Transfer of knowledge for those who know to those who are ignorant. Uh, but not just in long run, but also in the short run, that never works. Communication it should and must be bidirectional. So it should be actually a dialogue. We should start by asking questions. And when you ask questions to the general population, you have to acknowledge that there are subgroups, there are individuals who hold uh, beliefs uh, or have different cultural background, uh, even religion and whatever. And we must know this. We must know our context to uh, change, address, and tailor the communication that we use so that we are truly communicating in, in a way that is efficacious uh, and works eventually to convey messages, but most importantly, so that people change their behaviors in a way that is functional to the public health interventions that we're putting in place, okay? Because each and all of them matter. Okay, it goes so far as far to the core design of what we do and, and the communication means and, and things like this. Okay, this has been highly criticized. It's not today's topic, um, um, but it's an interesting chapter, particularly because of this term. You may be familiar with infodemic, which is an official term. So it's the idea that not to these days, uh, where social media and many other means may th let us think that it's a problem of our age. Now, it always happened that with an epidemic, there is also an epidemic of information. Most of these is misinformation, are false, but not necessarily because, you know, people are just spreading, uh, you know, false beliefs uh, to cause damage. It's simply because there is no control over this. And an, an observation of this infodemic is extremely important, must be controlled, and is highly challenging, and it creates a huge amount of confusion, and it is indeed part of an epidemic. Okay, now... The key part is this. So all this is preparatory for you to know, and that's the key goal of today's lecture. What are the key strategies to respond to a pandemic? And I'll reduce these to three for uh, a number of reasons. First, because mm, with one exception, I think, no countries in the world used any other strategy, strategy except the three that I will name in a minute. And second, because the, the ambition for the COVID-19 pandemic to go for the fourth strategy, which is elimination, is now demonstrated to be essentially impossible. So what are these? Well, first of all, let me explain to you that strategies essentially um, are indispensable when we need to have concerted efforts for, by many actors at different levels. And a strategy is something that in public health is used widely. So we have a policy, we have a statement about our values and preferences and our objectives, but also what we want to attain. So this is a strategy, a health strategy is a typical tool and is a, comp a composition of very coherent things that we do in actions where we specify who does what, when and why. Okay, so that's a typical public health thing. Okay, these are the three strategies that we can use to handle and reduce the impact of an epidemic. Containment is the first one, and they are ordered in, a, in, a, in, the, in the time where you can set them up. So at the very beginning, you try to contain. We'll see in a minute what this means. Then you have the mitigation, and then you have the suppression. You may stay at a mitigation level, and that what ha that's what happened in most Western countries. Few countries in the world use the suppression, which, as it sounds, is a lot more ambitious. So what is really important, though, is that why, when you look into these strategies, you will recognize that the interventions, the public health uh, things, actions that you ask people, members of the populations of the public to enact, put in place and collaborate with are pretty much the same. When we say, okay, so how do you distinguish a strategy if they're actually using the same resources? Because it's primarily a matter of timing, duration and combination of public health measures that we're talking about. That applies particularly for the COVID-19 where essentially we had no other resources or idea because we had no clue about the disease, we had no clue about the pathogen, it was impossible to treat. There were no vaccines back then, so we really had to use the basics. So these basics, public health interventions, are absolutely the same across the board. Now, the point, though, is that the objective, the goal, what you try to attain with each of these strategies is different. and Make them different. And that's the political decision or the public health decision that you take. So, for instance, with containment, you reduce the impact of the epidemic. Well, okay. For the other, is reduce the impact of the epidemic. It's reduced the impact. But 
the aim is to break the chain of transmissions. Contact tracing, quarantine, isolation. Okay, so in the beginning, containment, because of the number of cases, was thought to be the way forward. And you may remember Tedros, the director of the World Health Organization, say, response to the pandemic is test, test, test. But yeah, but with implications. <laughs> Once you test, you have to test positives, so you have to have a system in place so that you contain them, means that you really make sure that they are isolated and that you quarantine those who got in contact with this case, which was not the case in most Western countries. Even though we may have traced fairly good contacts of uh, diagnosed cases, we did not really enforce the public health measures. So people did get out, even though they were isolated, and containment cannot work that way. Okay? Now, the one that we lived a lot and we still are in is mitigation. And mitigation, as we said, is essentially about flattening the curve. So is spreading the number of cases over time. And it's really about the timing and duration of different measures to the most extreme, uh, the, the, broadly speaking, so on and so forth. And the most ambitious one is, of course, the suppression, which is a lot more uh, in, um, aggressive and aims to, to attain a goal that is, <laughs> it may sound crazy. It's like, okay, but if the virus needs humans to replicate, we just simply do not provide any opportunity to the virus to replicate. How do you do that? Well, essentially, you let those who have the disease be isolated or die of, of the disease, whatever, preventing them entirely to get in contact with anybody else. So the virus cannot infect any other person. So essentially, you reduce to zero, you suppress any contagion. And is it too ambitious? Is it impossible? Well, maybe in a few years, we will have the real Chinese data, and we will see whether the largest country in terms of population of the world really managed to uh, enforce uh, a suppression strategy, which, according to the official numbers, did pay back, did pay back, because we're talking about few cases and few deaths due to COVID-19 because of a huge effort of suppression in that country. Okay, uh, let me just remark a fact that, of course, context, geography, culture, would let you choose across which of these strategies you're going to be using and a combination of them. In most cases, we have lead combination of the three strategies. Sometimes we were confused. Are we still in a containment or a mitigation? Are we going back to containment? Things like this. But, of course, extreme examples like New Zealand or maybe Australia. Yeah, we talk a lot about Australia because of uh, Djokovic. And so how culturally that was perceived that a person not vaccinated could just go around in a country where every person was asked to essentially make huge sacrifices. That's why we must understand what has happened and why people were reluctant to accept that one tennis champion could behave in a different way in their own countries after two years. And that, oh, okay, may sound surprising, but Australia is the biggest island in the world. Okay, this is it's a stupid statement, but that it is. So they did isolate the country. Okay, so you can attain suppression through isolating the biggest island in the world. Okay, so that's to say that these three strategies may be chosen also uh, through the contextualization that goes uh, uh, far as the geography that you have. So each country played differently through these strategies because of that. And we know that in Switzerland, that, you know, the strategies were not necessarily coherent across cantons at all times in the pandemic. And we also know that there are cultural aspects that vary a lot across cantons in terms of what public health measures were perceived to be acceptable and therefore endorsed and adhered to by the general population. You know, there are some rural parts of, of the country where people will say, you know, I meet on average a couple of people anyway every day. Why should I be doing any additional uh, sacrifice? Uh, I'm fine. So the risk perception did change because of the culture and also the characteristic of their lifestyles. Okay, um, let me just uh, go to this table. You can browse it in, in the slides, which, which I'll provide you with, but essentially reiterating the concept that all of the major basic public health interventions tiny interventions one at a time. The one that have been talked about extensively in the media and for you, etc., etc., applies to this. But what varies is how much we push on each of these and how we combine them, okay? Which would qualify them in a coherent strategy or not. But because of overlaps, 
some of these strategies may have happened at the same time, and that, of course, caused additional confusion. Okay, time. We're running out of time. Vaccination, very fast. We jump this. This guy is Jenner. You know the story. It's just a successful story, so you know what a vaccine is. And the very beginning of the story was a little bit dreadful to people to accept to be inoculated with the pathogen, not to get the disease. At that time, it must have been really, really difficult to accept. Nevertheless, coverage in the UK was initially very, very high. And because of the characteristics of smallpox, this is the only example of a human, human-to-human -human transmission uh, infectious disease that has been eradicated, so that no longer exists. Well, actually, we should say that it does exist. And I have another adult, so it's a story that I'm not, I don't have the time to tell you, but you may know that there still is a pathogen of smallpox in two labs in the world, in Russia and United States. Talking about that today, because of the political situation, sounds like, ooh, wow, that's not ideal, because potentially smallpox could be reintroduced in a world where the majority, yeah, the majority of the population is no longer vaccinated, because we discontinued vaccination because the disease was eradicated. Okay, so that is the the storytelling behind this is light, and we can have a lengthy discussion about it and the bioterrorism implications of an eradicated disease. But that was a fantastic, successful experience. And that's why in public health, we do not rule out the possibility that diseases, infectious diseases, may be eradicated. So we can get rid of them definitely. But that occurs only once. So we should probably aim for elimination which is essentially the, the fact that the disease does not replicate. So the R0 is well below 1. So there is no epidemic. And that's what, in fact, happens with Ebola. But then it comes back at times. That's what we did with Zika, but then it comes back at times. What will happen with COVID-19? We don't know. Will it become endemic? So we will be leaving with it, like the influenza. C can it be possible? We don't know. And until we don't know, we have to try different options. So these days, without providing comments on whether it's right or wrong, we decided to relapse all major public health measures in the hope that letting this Omicron variant truly go around and in fact, the vast majority of the population, this will contribute not to reduce susceptible people, because people get reinfected even if they are vaccinated, but essentially we reduce the likelihood of the fact that there will be variants that are more, much more dangerous than Omicron. This is the idea behind what we're doing right now, and we don't know whether it will work. So are we still in the pandemic? Uh, yes, <laughs> it's far from being over, and we have no idea, no idea in what ways it will be over. But for sure, it will be a public health response. And with this, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your expertise and your knowledge and uh, your passion and research with us. Um, I know uh, for those of you who are watching on the live stream, uh, at some point it will cut automatically. Uh, but for those who have questions, I know we're running uh, over time now, but uh, perhaps we have time for one question online and one question from the live audience. Perhaps that would be nice, uh, just so that those who are watching online don't miss out. I'm sure people are bursting with questions. Uh, if there is a question uh, from the uh, on-site audience, I'd love to, to invite you to address uh, Professor Albanese with your questions now. So much information, so much information overload. No questions? <coughs> um, I'm not sure if this is an important question, but um, yes. <laughs> um, why did children n not have to wear masks in school, for example, because uh, in my opinion, they still spread the virus, but they didn't have to um, adhere to all these strategies. Why is that? 
Well, the, the, poli the decision was entirely political and in our country, so uh, politicians were advised uh, for um, relapsing uh, the use of masks in children because they were balancing the pros and cons. So essentially because uh, we know that the disease is not that impactful in terms of the clinical course and mortality is virtually zero in children, we accepted that they would contribute to spreading the infection because children have other developmental priorities that would have had an impact on them, probably on the long term. Was it right? Was it wrong? It's also a matter of feasibility. Can you really keep children age four, five, wearing properly a mask and continuously? So if you don't do it in a proper way, uh, you, you probably shouldn't do it at all. And that's what the task force uh, at some point uh, decided for children. But in some countries, <laughs> children did wear masks, age two and three. <coughs> Thank you. Um, we actually have a question from those who are watching online. I have a question uh, also about school children. Um, well, uh, the question was, should an obligatory subject about information in health science like reading statistics or finding reliable resources, be taught in school to school children <coughs> to prevent the mass of misinformation as we have seen in the COVID pandemic. Um, this person specifically referring to um, your, um, your reading material, so actually what you um, have published on pages 13 and 14 on your chapter on communication. Yeah, sure. Actually, <clears throat> in public health, uh, we exploit uh, schools and therefore children to provide education in a formal environment so that not only can children and students get to know more uh, about the reasoning, for instance, and so they can use the knowledge that they acquire in a critical way, but also because, in this case, in a positive way, they can spread it. So they go back home and they exert a very positive effect on their parents and grandparents, their families, and, and their communities coming back from school. And this is quite interesting. There are a number of public health uh, interventions that are exactly based on the idea that you work in school, in education, in formal education, to actually have an impact at the general population level. But for sure, uh, vaccination and vaccine hesitancy, uh, we know, is quite high uh, because of risk perception or misperception in children and adolescents. So these programs, which must be built with, that was my example, so in a dialogic way with children, means that you have to engage them in a way so that you, as we say technically, empower them so that they can design their own communication strategy directed to them for themselves, which is, first of all, correct, which is important, but is also providing them with a way of thinking and interpreting the information that they would receive anyway as soon as they leave school and, and go back home or just watch television or whatever uh, new social media. So yes, yes, this is crucial. Was it done? Uh, not that I know, not to the extent that it was, it was hoped. It would have been a great investment, uh, particularly before uh, as progressively vaccinations were recommended for younger, uh, younger people. It would have been a great investment because as we stated elsewhere in a couple of publications, having a vaccine doesn't mean having a vaccination. You have to have the people who want to get vaccinated. And children would have been a fantastic driver to uh, break a little bit of uh, vaccination hesitancy that in this country are highly problematic to these days. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And uh, apologies that today, uh, with the combination of uh, some technical issues and, and other things, and it being the first of the series, um, we did actually manage to run over a little bit on the time. Um, but if I understand correctly, your slides should be available uh, for those who wish to see them online. So that would be great. So um, should you wish to take a look at the materials that you've seen today in more detail, then please do that. You also have access to the reading material also through the online program. So please don't hesitate to look at that as well. Uh, and um, for those who are uh, still with us on the live stream or who are jo uh, joining us on the Zoom, uh, then please note also for those here on site that the next session will be uh, the... 
session by Professor Milo Puhan, uh, which is on public health research, specifically uh, on COVID-19 here in Switzerland. So if that sounds interesting to you, then please join us next week. And uh, if you haven't done so already, then I do encourage you to uh, download this QR code before you leave the room today so that you can find out a little bit more about all of these different public health uh, topics and how they relate to the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much uh, for joining us for the first of this lecture series and hope to see you next week. Thank you and thank you.